the respective Thai, the beloved community. Welcome to our first full day of the silent retreat. And my name is Sister Toi Nguyen or Sister Insight. I am here for three months during the rain retreat and the monastics and are in the middle of a rain retreat. And we have um, a number of long-term practitioners who are here for the whole three months to practice with us. And it's a great joy for the community to welcome everyone to this retreat. It is also my first time participating in a silent retreat. During the rain retreat we have um, in, in the community here in Magnolia Grove, we have um, one day of silence and we had our first one in September. And that was a great joy for me because it wasn't just practicing silence, but it was also screen free, electronic free. And that was really, um, really an, an amazing experience for me to not have to be you know, like occupied by these kind of things so that I can just focus completely you know, on the practice, coming back to the present moment, doing reading, and um, enjoy walking out in nature. But this retreat, we have five days to really enjoy that, to really benefit from not having to converse with anybody, or I hope it's also a screen-free retreat, right? Yay. Five days of no electronics, screen-free. That's a big privilege you know, in our time now because this thing is the greatest preoccupation. It's a way for us to run away from ourselves facing what is, what is there in the present moment. The power of silence, that's the name of the retreat. And um, these five days we will experience the power of silence on our body and on our mind. And I thought, wow, these people are pretty brave <laughs> to come to a retreat, a silent retreat for five days. Because sometimes talking can be really, really nice. You know, like, it's a way for us to kind of um, not having to face what's there all the time. But in this retreat, that's what we're going to be doing, facing this all the time, facing ourselves all the time, because we're not distracted by like conversations with other people. But I also think it's really nice because we don't have to feel torn or conflicted, having to like decide whether I should engage in a conversation or not. You know, like you're sitting in front of someone new, and you want to get to know who this person is. And, and if it's not a silent retreat, then you feel like an urge to, to say something, you know, like to start a conversation. And if you don't feel comfortable starting, striking a conversation, a conversation with someone, it can be really uncomfortable inside. But during this retreat, we don't have to talk to anybody. We don't have to face that discomfort of keeping silent in the presence of all these wonderful new people that we want to get to know. I mean, we do have a chance to speak. It will be in Dharma sharing. So be prepared 
your only opportunity to speak during the, the retreat. And silence is a really important practice in our community. We do practice silence um, every day. There is a stretch of time during the day when we practice what we call noble silence. You know, from the end of the evening session to the next day after breakfast. Everyone hear me okay? Yeah? And um, noble silence, it's not just a silence, but it has to be a noble silence. It's not just a silence of our mouth, Shh, not a hush here, yeah. but it's a hush here. Yeah. It's a silence where we're not just stopping the conversation, the chattering, but we also stop the conversation and chattering in our head. And so that we can be really present for ourselves and for, for what's there unfolding in the present moment within and around us. And, um, and it's a silence that the Buddha called a thundering silence. It's a powerful silence. It's a silence that can really heal us. It's a silence in which we are embodied by the energy of mindfulness, the energy of presence. We are there, awake. So this is what we want to cultivate during the week that kind of noble, thundering silence where we are truly there. It's not just the silencing of the conversation with other people, but it's also the silencing of thoughts, stories, and narratives in our head as well. And that's the hardest part of the retreat. It's the silencing of our head. And only when we are silencing our head that our silence become a noble silence, a thundering silence. I just love that expression of thundering silence, a powerful silence. And during this week, in practicing silence, it is also a chance for us to return to our true home, to tap into our true home, to connect with our true home. A true home is not just a physical space with a roof above us. I mean, in the last two weeks, we've really witnessed that a physical home is not, not very safe, you know, in the, in the hurricane, with the tornadoes and the wind. And I mean, houses got blown away, washed away, lifted off its foundation, washed away by this flood water. With that, we just need to enter our house and lock the door and we're safe. But when we see these images, we know that that's not even a safe place. A physical house is not a true home. Because some of us can be right in the middle of our house and we don't feel at home. So a true home is here now. When I am there for myself, when I am there, embracing what needs to be embraced, accepting, things that are difficult to accept, 
and just loving ourselves the way we are. Being present so that we can truly really understand who we are, why we are the way we are, why we suffer the way we do, why we react the way we react. And only when we are there, in the present moment, with the energy of mindfulness, wherever that may be, here or out there, when we are there for ourselves with the energy of mindfulness, we are in our true home. And it's only there that we can feel safe that we can feel at ease, that we can touch the stability, stability, solidity in us. There are two, two practices that I want to mention here, uh, very important practices for this for this retreat. And that's the practice of deep listening and loving speech. Because when we talk about silence, we need to also talk about speech, right? So let me start with listening, deep listening because we will be listening most of the time during this retreat. And um, the practice of listening is not just listening with the ears, but listening with the heart, allowing the heart to hear. Not just, maybe sometimes it's good also not to focus so much on the ear, but on the heart. Listening with love, that's called compassionate, listening, deep listening. And the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara that we just evoked is, is the embodiment of that practice, compassionate listening, deep listening, listening without judging, listening without reacting. And in our case, in our context, it's really listening to our inner voice, to that inner speech that's happening all the time. This voice, like this, you know, unseasoned voice that goes on and on and on. Thai call it the non-stop thinking radio station that broadcasts 24 hours, day in and day out. The NST radio station. The capacity to listen to other people depends very much on the capacity to listen to ourselves. And sadly, we don't really listen to ourselves. How many of us really listen to ourselves on a daily basis? Yeah. We talk about understanding and love. Yes, yeah, two qualities that we want to cultivate for the practice of mindfulness. When we understand something, someone, ourselves, then we can really love, we can truly love. But to be able to understand 
We need to be in the present moment. We need to be there. We need to be there with ourselves so that we can really hear what's there in our hearts and minds. We're so busy up here all the time, you know, this NSC radio, that we don't really hear what's there in here on our body and in our mind. I mean, for some of us, sometimes it takes like a terminal illness, like cancer or something like that, for us to stop and listen to our body, listen to our mind. But as practitioners, we don't want to wait for that, you know, to stop. We want to learn how to stop here now in order to listen to ourselves so that we can really understand ourselves, understand who we are, understand causes and conditions that made us the way we are. understand means to be able to stop to listen to ourselves with love, to listen to the parts in ourselves that may be really uncomfortable to experience or to feel or to hear. You know, the the judgment in us, the criticism. A lot of our criticism and judgment are like directed towards ourselves. I think we're the, we're the harshest judge of ourselves. Listen to the reaction, to the pain that may be there. Listening to like this nagging feeling. Sometimes we have like this nagging feeling in, in the depths of our being and we don't, can't really pinpoint to it and we don't even want to face it because we're afraid that it may be something bigger than our capacity to embrace. Listening to our restlessness, our anxiety. So during this retreat, we have an opportunity to really listen to all those things so that we can understand where they're coming from. Only when we are able to listen to ourselves deeply that we can heal ourselves. For example, if we are listening to ourselves and we feel this restlessness, when that's already halfway through transformation, just be able to recognize that there's restlessness in my body and mind. It's already a big part of transformation already. Bringing mindfulness in to help us to recognize and it's the mindfulness energy also helps us to soothe and to calm that restlessness so that we can really understand where it comes from. And it's the understanding that transforms, that transforms the depths, the root of that restlessness. So the practice of noble silence, last night we heard, you know, like different practices, you know, the different tools to help cultivate the energies of mindfulness. And we'll talk more about, we'll talk more on the different tools uh, later but let me just go to the love and speech. So love and speech. Love and speech is 
speech that is loving and constructive, speech that would um, that would bring well-being, joy, and happiness in ourselves and other people. Our speech depends also very much on our inner speech, the, con the kind of conversation, the kind of voice with telling ourselves, we're talking to ourselves. This self-talk in the back of our head. That's what we want to listen to, that voice, that conversation in the back of our head, this narrative that go on endlessly. And a lot of time, these narratives, these narratives, these stories, pretty negative. Anybody ever had that experience? Most of us really experience that, right? Thoughts and thinking are a kind of inner speech. And a lot of time, they are just habit energies that, that have been transmitted to us, you know, from our parents, our ancestors. Sometimes they have been reinforced by, you know, our education, our environment, our society, our friends, our upbringing. And because we are feeding ourselves with these negative speech, what comes out also becomes negative. And so, when we talk about working with speech, you know, in working the fourth mindfulness training, if anybody is familiar with the five mindfulness trainings, the fourth mindfulness training is about loving speech. And to be able to practice loving speech, we need to work with that inner voice so that this inner voice It's one that is loving and kind towards ourselves and other people. And so because this inner voice had been transmitted to us a lot of the time, we don't have to beat ourselves down and judge ourselves and criticize ourselves for this unkind speech towards herself. The practice is to bring awareness to that inner speech, to listen deeply to that inner voice in ourselves and to see if we can just shift that voice into one that's wholesome and positive. We call it appropriate attention. We give rise to appropriate attention, which means that things that are nourishing to us, the kind of conversation, the kind of voice, the kind of speech we're talking to ourselves that is kind and wholesome and healthy. So if we notice ourselves like feeding negativities in our thinking about ourselves and about other people, just breathe and smile and see if we can just shift it to something that's focusing on something that's wholesome and positive about that person. Say, I'm thinking about my sister here and I'm thinking negatively. And if I caught myself, aha, uh -huh, you know, mindfulness come in in time for me to like really pause. And then I look at 
her and see if there's something positive about her that I have not seen or have not thought of. So that's a way for me to shift. It's the same thing for myself as well. So I come up here and I feel a bit nervous. I mean, it's pretty normal. And then I recognize, wow, this is my inner child. The inner child that had been judged. The inner child that felt inferior. And so what I did was that I stopped and I breathed in and out. And I said to that inner child, you're good. You're good enough. You are enough. You are loved. And immediately that energy dissipated. That's the kind of shifting that we need to do with ourselves in our consciousness, in our mind. Shifting from negative conversation, narratives and stories about ourselves and about other people and about the world to one that's positive and wholesome. To one that go in lines with right view, which is really Really, the insight of interconnectedness, the insight that I cannot exist in isolation. Who I am, it's made by countless elements, including my, my parents and my ancestors and all those conditions that were there in my life. And so that inner child was made by all these conditions, was created, was, and so just being there for her and knowing that this inner child, yeah, it's, it's me, but it's also my parents' inner children. So also my, and my grandparents and their children because they are here with me, in me. And that's the insight of intervening. That's right view. That's the right kind of thinking, positive thinking that we want to shift our attention to. Because it is only with that kind of thinking voice in our head that can really open a heart that can really help us to understand deeply ourselves and accept ourselves deeply, and that can really heal us. So let us listen to the sound of the bell and come in touch with that inner child in ourselves. And smile into her and accept her or accept, accept them the way they are. So this inner voice, these narratives and stories we have in our head are really, really powerful in affecting and influence the way we see ourselves and in the way we relate to other people and to the world. They're, they're the motivation, they're the incentives that push us to say, to think, and to act in a certain way. It's like sometimes we, we just don't have any control, like no free will. 
were being manipulated, so to speak, by these energies in there. These energies that we have told ourselves, these narrative stories about who we are and about who this person is and about who these people are and about what this world is about. We call it watering the seeds. Our seeds, this negativity, have been watered by, you know, our situations, upbringing, education, you know, like all these things that we've experienced in our life, but also by ourselves. So let me just touch on the studies of the mind a bit so some of you may understand. Where is it coming from, like this inner voice? How many of you have studied Buddhist psychology? Yeah. Well, I'll recap for you because this is really important for us to be able to understand then our mind, we need to also understand how our mind works. So here's a model, one of the models of the mind. So in the, there are different layers to our mind. We call, it, we call them the different, the different levels, the different functions of the mind. And in the, the depths of our mind or our consciousness, there's a layer that's called the store consciousness, store consciousness. store consciousness. And this is a layer that's like the earth, that it contains, it holds, and it preserves all kinds of seeds. Seeds in here. A whole spectrum of seeds for the most negative to the most positive, anything you can imagine. They are all in here. Because this consciousness, the store consciousness, just it, does, it doesn't just come with our own life, our own person. It's not an individual consciousness alone. It's also a collective consciousness. Collective in a sense that it contains our ancestors, not just like our recent ancestors, like our grandparents, parents, or you know, great-grandparents, but it goes back to the beginning of time, like our primal ancestors are in here. And it goes even beyond our primal ancestors, also in here. So it's a collective consciousness. It stored every possibilities. So we are we're made of countless possibilities. We have countless possibilities here. And up here, It's our mind, mind consciousness. There's another part, but we don't want to talk about it this time. It's called the manas. We can talk about that at a different time, at another time, at another retreat maybe. Or my siblings will come and talk about that in the next two Dharma talks. 
store consciousness in manas are sort of like a subconscious, you know, in like in Western psychology where we can't, we can't really have access. And yet it's, it's a force, it's an energy, like a force field, like an energy that, 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 influence, that influences and affects us in practically everything about us. Affects our body, our mind. It affects our way of speaking, talking, speaking, thinking, acting. And there are the other five senses, the sense consciousnesses. There's the eye, the, the eye consciousness, the ear consciousness, the nose consciousness, the tongue, and the body consciousnesses. And these are like windows into our soul, so to speak. Because whatever comes in through these windows, they go into our soul consciousness and they touch seeds in here. They kind of like triggers that trigger these seeds so that these seeds, once they are being triggered, they manifest up here in our mind. And so this is when we know, we see what is happening to us. So for example, right now, you know, none of us, none of us is angry. So, you know, where's the seed of anger? I don't have any anger. What are you talking about? Well, maybe something you hear, maybe something you see can touch that seed and the seed will manifest, and this is when you know what anger is. You experience anger, and you know, I do have anger. So the quality of our mind depends very much on the quality of what's here in our, in our store consciousness. So, when our voice, our inner voice, is negative, when it's full of judgment and criticism, we know that in the depths of our store consciousness, these seeds are quite significant. And so that's why they're so easily triggered. So that's why they manifest a lot, often. So that's when, when we talk about watering the seeds, that's what we meant. Coming in touch, you know, with the world through our senses, our seeds get watered, get triggered, and then they manifest, and that's when we can feel what's there in ourselves as mental formations, mental entity. And our inner voice, mind consciousness, that voice that we tell ourselves, we're feeding ourselves, we're watering these seeds in ourselves. So when we listen to ourselves, we're not just seeing these conversations, these narratives and stories in ourselves, but we have to be able to see the depths of it. Experiences that we have gone through in our life that had fed that kind of 
that kind of mind states. These kind of conversations, narratives. And it's the understanding that transforms. So we talked about mindfulness. We talked about cultivating the energies of mindfulness. I'd like to share a little bit about it. What is exactly mindfulness? Mindfulness is the awareness of what's there. Mindfulness, it's an energy of knowing. And it is also one of those positive and wholesome seeds in the depths of our store consciousness. It's our innate, awakened nature. We call it the baby Buddha sometimes. Because mindfulness, it's really an energy that helps us to wake up. When we are embodied by mindfulness, that means we're there completely to feel, to experience, and to see what's there on our body, in our, you know, in our mind, and also in the surrounding. It's a kind of light that once we lit it up, you know, through the practice of conscious breathing, mindful walking, eating, you know, practically everything we do during the day, are really the are really practices of mindfulness, even when we are doing them in the pri in our private space, in the bathroom or in the toilet or in the shower, for instance, those become dharma doors. Just practices that help to strengthen our awareness to help the seed of mindfulness to manifest so that we are embodied by this light. And once we have the energy of mindfulness, the energy of, energy of being present, well, we're there, we're present. We're not in our head anymore, thinking about this and that. And, you know, we're not getting carried away by these 10,000 things of the world, in the world. We are truly there. When I look at this flower and I'm completely there, then I'm focusing on it. I'm present for it. I am concentrating on this flower. I'm looking deeply into this flower to see and to understand the nature of this flower. And that's called concentration. When we are present, we are concentrated and focused. So mindfulness gives rise to concentration. And when I stay long enough, I start to see really deeply into this flower. And that scene is called insight. Mindfulness, concentration, and insight are the three energies that are innate in us. They're, they're there in the store of consciousness, in the depths of our being. So when you're here, when you come into the practice, you're not asking, you know, from the teacher, from the community, for more of these energies. They can't really offer them to you. I mean, they can, they can, you know, their practice can really um, reflect it on you. Kind of like their practice is a mirror for you and helps you you know, like to come back to your practice. But every one of us already have them in ourselves. It's a matter of really taking up these Dharma doors, these tools for ourselves in order to really allow these energies to grow, to manifest in us. And it's the so mindfulness, concentration, and insight are the gist of Buddhist practices. 
of meditation. And everything that we've learned here, it's all about to cultivate these energies in us. And once we are embodied by this energy of insight, which is the energy of understanding, it gives us the power to see deeply and to heal ourselves. It's energy, the energy of insight or understanding is the energy that heals and transforms and liberates us and frees us. Let us listen to and send up the bell. I'm supposed to share on the first six exercises of mindful breathing, and I only have only 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, let me try to see if I can tackle this in 15 minutes. So, everything we do can become a practice of mindfulness. Everything that we do in our daily life can become tools they become the Dharma doors when we are doing them with mindfulness, right? Well, one of those tools that's always there is our breathing. It's a really important part, a really important Dharma door. And in and Thai um, had shared with us that when Thai learned the sutra, the sutra on mindful breathing. He felt he was the happiest person on earth. Like he had found treasures that have always been there. Even though Thai had practiced breathing before that to heal his body, you know, he went through a period of sickness when he was younger. His heart, his health was really fragile as a young man. And, and the breathing had really helped him to cure, you know, strengthen his body, cure his illness. But in 1971, when Thai was already um, in exile, living in Paris and teaching in Sebon, he discovered the sutra he discovered a lot of things during that time because he had a lot of time. He was no longer having to, you know, he was settling down. He wasn't traveling a lot anymore to call for peace. He was traveling. He was settling down in Paris and was teaching. And he had a lot of time to do research at the library, and he discovered a lot of really wonderful insight. And one of those um, sutra that he encountered was the sutra on mindful breathing. And, um, and so that's been Thai's practice, and Thai had transmitted this practice to us. Thai is the master of the practice of mindful breathing. I, I just feel so tempted to share the story, <laughs> you know, about, about Thai when he was really sick. So he was in coma for more than a month. 
And in his coma, even though when he was in a coma, his breathing was always like 98, 99%. His oxygen level was like 99, 98%. He was still practicing mindful breathing in his karma. And that was what kept him alive because it, it was such a massive st stroke that the doctor thought he's going to pass away in a couple of days. And all of us from Plum Village, you know, took turn. Like there were 200 of us at the monasteries in Plum Village. And we took turn to go to the hospital and went into his room. And each of one of us stood there for like two minutes just to breathe in and out with Thai and to come in touch with Thai for the last time. But it was his mindful breathing that had kept him alive and that helped him to go out of his coma. So when you think of Thai, you have to see that this is like a master who had mastered his practice of mindful breathing. So when you breathe, you know that Thai is there breathing with you. Anyway, so the first exercise of mindful breathing. So mindful breathing is just recognizing that the breath is happening, noticing that the breath is there. Because the moment we notice that the breath is happening, and it happens all the time. We're alive because we're breathing. But we're, we're not aware of it most of the time. And so when we bring our attention to our breathing, to our breath, you know what happens? Our mind stops. This NSD radio station stops broadcasting. It's there. We are there. We are present. So that's the power of breathing. I said, instead of, you know, getting carried away by habits, putting so much energy in our brain, you know, so that this thinking is so powerful, it just drag us along with it. Focusing on the breath helps this to be quiet, and we are there in the present moment. And one time Thai, you know, often Thai said, the breathing is delicious. And I thought, how does that happen? How is that possible? Like breathing, a delicious breath. But when I practiced it, and I thought, Thai, I know what you mean. Because being with the breath, just focusing on the breath, and with all these thoughts and stories falling down, falling away. I feel like sense of well-being in my body and in my mind. It felt like I have tasted the best kind of food for my soul. So, the first exercise is aware of the breathing. Just simply aware that the breathing is happening without trying to make it long, short, trying to make, you know, without manipulating it. If we do try to control and manipulate it, it can be really tiring, especially here. I, I, I had that experience when I was in office to the point where I just give up practicing mindful breathing. Because every time I come back, there's this tendency to control. We all have that tendency, right? Well, I found one way that helps me to kind of loosen that control. I go to my toes and my feet, and I breathe with my toes and my feet. Because I'm still in the body, but I can be away as far as I can, away from here, which tend to like to control everything. So, just aware that the breathing is there, the breathing is happening. However it is, I'm noticing it. I'm kind of like riding with the breathing, riding the waves of the breath. 
When it goes up high, I go up high. When it goes down low, I go down low. Kind of like that. Sort of like a dance with a breath. That's a really beautiful image to see ourselves dancing with our breath. The second exercise, follow the in-breath, the out-breath, from the beginning to the end. So the dance continue with the breath. Not just like I dance and then I take off, like an airplane that kind of like start out on the ground and then shoo. A lot of time, this is how our practice is. We're not with the breath anymore. Well, the second exercise is helping us to dance with the breath from the beginning to the end of the breath. The third exercise of mindful breathing is breathing in, I'm aware of my body. Breathing out, I smile to my body. The body is part, the body, the breath is part of the body. So when we are aware of the breath, and we are really there with the breath, we are also there for the body. So the first two exercises, we're just establishing ourselves with the breath so that we are there. And then the third exercise, we're going into the body. And I just, I love, these are like my main practice, the breath and the body. And when I have like difficulties like controlling the breath and, made, and it made it really hard to breathe because I felt really tight here, then I go to the body. Because the body is something I can touch. It's tangible. If I cannot practice with my body or my breath, I don't think I can practice with my mind. <laughs> Because the mind is really good at kind of, you know, changing shapes and form. Kind of tricky, the mind, sometimes. And so dwelling on the body can help me to be here now. So body awareness. I feel what's there in my body. I feel different parts of my body. I feel my body sitting here. Whatever I do, I'm recognizing. I'm moving my hand. I recognize that I'm moving my hand. I feel it. So in the practice of meditation, practice of mindfulness, I don't think about my hand moving. That's already here, thinking. I feel that's from the heart level. So the practice is heart level, not head level. So I feel my hand moving, which means I am being mindful of my hand moving. I don't, it's not I think my hand moving. That's already, I'm not, I'm not aware of my hand moving. I'm thinking. You got it? Does that make sense? Thank you. So, go into the heart. And this is what we've been reminded countless times. Go into your heart. Go into our heart level. Feel. Experience. Not think. The more we think, the more we, we're confused. But the more we feel, the more we experience what's there. So I feel I'm aware of my body. And it's not just about cultivating our mindfulness as we you know, become aware of the body, but it's also healing our body. You know, like this little moment that I'm aware of my body, that's a moment of love, true love, self-love. So when we talk about self-love, that's what it means. Just being there with my body without judging or reacting, without hating my body, rejecting my body. Sometimes you have that kind of dysmorphia, is that what you call it? Where we don't like our body. Or we don't accept our body. We don't think it's good enough. I mean, I've, um, 
I've, you know, facilitated Dharma sharing groups for the young adult. And these are like beautiful young women. And yet, in the sharing, a lot of them had like this kind of like distorted perception about their body to the point where they would have like, you know, like issues like limic, you know, anorexic, eating disorders because they, they don't accept their body. And so being aware of the body, I am also here now calming, healing my body, accepting my body the way I am, the way it is, however it is. It's the only thing I have in this lifetime, and I accept it the way it is. So maybe we can just have like this, this practice of like, I love you, body. I did that to my mentee one time. One of the exercises that I offer to my mentee, my monastic mentee, is that you look into the mirror at least once a day, and you say to yourself, you look into your eyes, and you say, I love you. And I was really surprised because some of them couldn't do it. <laughs> And, and so body awareness is like a practice of love, love, loving ourselves, accepting ourselves. And when I'm there with my body, then I can, then it becomes calmer. Whatever it is, tension, anxiety that's there, the stress, that may be there, can dissipate. So that leads to the fourth exercise. Breathing in, I calm my body. Breathing out, I calm my body. I smile to my body. Mindfulness leads to calming. Mindfulness leads to healing. Mindfulness leads to understanding. The fifth exercise, we are venturing into the domain of the feeling. And before we talk about, you know, like hardcore feeling, like strong emotions, We need to cultivate joy and happiness. We kind of need to strengthen our, you know, like our, our muscle first before we want to tackle something that's really heavy and difficult, right? So the fifth exercise is generating or cultivating joy by breathing. Cultivating joy, I breathe out. And the sixth exercise is generating or cultivating happiness, I breathe in. Cultivating happiness, I breathe out. These are really important practices, joy and happiness. It's the joy and happiness that that nourishes us. But it's also the incentives for us to continue to practice, right? I mean, if you come to the practice and all you see is suffering and everything you do is suffering, well, you don't want to continue with that, right? You want to be able to experience joy and happiness. It's, it's one of those things that I said, it made the breathing so delicious because you experience like this joy and happiness that's circulating on the body. When you become aware of the body, you feel this energy circulating, like this, I call it the happy energy, 
because you feel like this well-being, this sense of well-being that's like circulating in the body with that energy of mindfulness, that awareness of the body itself, it feels really good. Well, that's the incentive for me to continue to practice. In my life as a nun, I've been practicing as a nun for 31 years, by the way. I started out when I was 22, and then uh, living in Plum Village for a year before I ordained at age 23. And it's been 31 years I ordained, living in the community. And, um, and so the joy and happiness are what keeps me going. It's the energizer, you know, like that commercial, that advertisement of the energizer battery, the energizer that keeps going, that keeps, that keeps me going. But where can you find joy and happiness inside? I mean, some of us look in, and there's zero joy and happiness. It's just darkness. Like, there's no light at the end of the tunnel for some of us. Anybody ever experienced something like that? Now, how do we cultivate joy and happiness? I can't just sit there and say, cultivating joy when I don't feel really joyful. When we are embodied by the energy of mindfulness and the energy of mindfulness helps us to accept whatever is there, we recognize whatever is there and we accept whatever is there, whether it is very dark space inside, whether it is pain or suffering, I accept that. This energy of mindfulness comes in and helps to embrace that kind of dark, darkness, that pain and that suffering. And it's the energy of mindfulness that gives rise to joy and happiness. So we have these three expressions, four expressions. Mindfulness gives rise to joy and happiness. Concentration gives rise to joy and happiness. Insight gives rise to joy and happiness. When I'm present and I recognize what's there, like I'm truly alive, it gives you great joy and happiness. I went through a phase where, I mean, my practice is not always the last 31 years. It hasn't always been like this, by the way. If you think our practice should always be like this or like this, you'll be disillusioned. <laughs> it's like this. Dips, dips, dips. But when it dips, it comes up and it comes up a bit higher. And the dip may be a bit lower, kind of like that. Kind of like a snake that kind of like going up and down like that slithering like that. And and when I'm mindful, it helps me to see. It helps you to see clear. It's like I'm taking off this like these tinted glasses that it helps me to see myself clear. And it's the seeing that gives joy and happiness. That's insight that brings joy and happiness. Gives rise to joy and happiness. It's like, aha, that kind of like a high experience that we have that can give such joy and happiness. Anybody ever experienced that? Yay. Yeah. We have the tools. We have mindfulness, concentration, and insight in us that once we tap into them, can help us to experience joy and happiness here and now. 
We don't need any other things. We don't need a lot of material things to give us joy and happiness. Some people think that having a lot can give them joy and happiness, so they always buy. But once I have it, mm, kind of boring. You know, like, no longer interesting. They no longer give joy and happiness when you have these things. Kind of like it has, like, gives that internal kind of, like, I mean, short-lived kind of, like, pleasure of having these things. And then they no longer give you that pleasure because they are not conditions for true happiness. These external things are not conditioned for true happiness. So if you do see that these external things are what you need for your joy and happiness, this is an invitation for you to look deeply into that. Because according to our practice, true happiness, true joy comes from not what we have, comes from our being, being present, being mindful, with understanding, with love. That's what brings true joy and happiness. And when we are practicing and cultivating mindfulness, it gives rise to joy and happiness. We can actually experience joy and happiness, that delicious feeling in our body, in our mind. And then the fourth one, letting go gives joy, give rise to joy and happiness. Letting go. And um, letting go, not just about letting go of things. We do letting go of things can lighten up our load sometimes, you know, like to kind of like clear away the clutter in our house. Now, nowadays, we have a lot of people practicing minimalism. And, and um, gives great joy and happiness. Anybody here who is a minimalist? Yeah, gives joy and happiness. Not to be frittered away by this kind of, you know, like all the things around us. So many things. Letting go simply means just accepting whatever it is that's there without trying to make it different, without trying to make it the way we like it. Surrendering our needs to control and manipulate situations, ourselves, whatnot, that's letting go. Putting down that desire to change the other person or to change our suffering, but just accepting it. Just accepting it so that we can have enough peace of mind. We're no longer struggling and fighting. Just accepting it. And that gives us calm and clarity. My sisters are letting me know that it's time. Okay, so letting go, accepting gives us calm and clarity in order to see deeply into the situation so that we can deal with it wisely. So that's how we cultivate joy and happiness. But before we end, I want to share with you that today, 98 years ago, this very day, a baby boy came into the world. And that baby boy had affected all of us here and countless other people. Thai today is Thai continuation. 
of his physical existence. And yesterday and also today and tomorrow, especially today, people everywhere in the world are celebrating Tai's birthday, even though Tai is no longer there in person. And in celebrating Tai's continuation day, helps us to touch Tai in ourselves and to remind us that we are made of Tai's consciousness. He had transmitted his whole consciousness to us, one that's filled with love and peace and wisdom. And every one of us had experienced this consciousness of Thai. Every one of us had been affected by Thai's presence in this world. And um, before Thai passed away, you know, in, in one of his talks, several of his talks, Thai said that, you know, he didn't want us to build a stupa for him. A stupa in Buddhist tradition, high monks and nuns, once they pass away, their student will build them this stupa. This, it's kind of like um, a burial mound um, that, that um, everyone would come and just pay respect to, you know. Thai didn't want us to build a stupa like that for Thai. Because Thai said that Thai is not in the stupa. Thai is not even outside of the stupa either. But if there's anything of Thai, it's in your breathing and in your walking. So today, as a, continu as a gift, as an offering to Thai for Thai's continuation, let us all build that stupa in our heart and mind for Thai by coming in touch with our steps deeply, being present in every step we make, being present with our breath. Because it is, as Thai has said, in this breathing, this breath, and in the steps, that Thai is alive, that Thai is present in us. So thank you very much for listening. Sorry, I took a bit longer with all these stories. Thank you. So let us listen to the sounds of the bell. Coming back to our breath, coming back to our body, smiling to our breath, to our body. Breathing as if Thai is breathing with us. Thai is breathing for us. Thai is smiling through our smile. Happy continuation to Thai in everyone.